Welcome to Digital Physics with Jens. My name is Jens Tunstad. I'm an economist, a computer geek, and currently a student of physics at the University of Oslo. In this series, I will talk about what digital physics is and how it might be taking us closer to a paradigm shift in physics. Digital physics is a branch of physics that is relatively unknown. It's different, deep and digital, and it's bringing the standard model into contact with the things that we've been learning about since we discovered computers, such as Turing machines, cellular automata, and information theory. And here's one of my heroes, Alan Turing. Alan Turing basically invented the maths behind the computer. To be fair, that had partly been done before, but the world sadly forgot about the work of this woman who created the first computer program and this guy who built a pretty amazing calculator based on steam power. True story. But the modern computer began with Turing, which during the Second World War created a computer that was able to hack the German Enigma cipher, and that helped the Allies win the war. In the process, he created something called a Turing machine. This is a kind of mathematical description of the minimum requirements of a computer. It's actually a quite a simple device, which you can build yourself. It's simply reading a tape and deciding whether or not to move forward or backwards depending on if there's a hole in the tape or not. And this simple device can, given a long enough tape, be able to solve any computational problem that exists. Now, it turns out that this concept of universal Turing machine is really important for both digital physics and computer science. Like set theory, is the foundations for maths, a universal Turing machines are the foundation for a vast universe of complexity and possibility, computable space. From humble beginnings come great things. And now science is discovering that more and more stuff seems to be related to this principle of universal Turing machines. And it's not just computer stuff. We also have this thing called Turing patterns or Turing morphogenesis which is a model to explain why fish, animals and plants produce complex patterns that they use for camouflage. It's as if there's a tiny computer program that is creating this pattern on the puffer fish and these stripes on the tiger. Not convinced? Well, okay, take a look at this seashell here, right? And then have a look at this pattern over here. This weird pyramid is called Rule 30, 30, and it's created by a two-dimensional cellular automaton, which is a kind of Turing machine. They look the same, right? Well, does it mean that there's a computer program running on the seashell? Or perhaps it means that computation is something that spontaneously appears in nature. Perhaps computational computation is part and parcel of nature and even life. Observations like this are at the core of digital physics. It seems possible that much, perhaps even all, of the diversity and complexity that we see in the nature and universe could be a result of the principle of computation at a deeper level than we in our physics are able to go. And this, in turn, would make the most fundamental thing in the universe information processing. But to avoid confusion, I need to say a few words about another related term, computational physics. Computation is very important to both, but computational physics is not the same as digital physics. They are sometimes used interchangeably, and that can be confusing. The not so subtle difference is that digital physics is more of a philosophy for thinking about what the universe is and how it came to be whereas computational physics is a technical discipline used in traditional physics for making predictions and solving traditional physics problems. It's for doing physics with the assistance of computers, using techniques like Monte Carlo simulations, numerical integration, and so on. If a university or school, high school is strong on computational physics, it doesn't mean they know anything about digital physics. Computational physics tries to get as close as possible to the underlying mathematical equations of, for example, electromagnetism, gravity, and the equations of uh, the fundamental forces. 
To illustrate the difference to digital physics, let me briefly have a look at some examples of computational physics. We know that light is electromagnetic radiation, right? So if we can simulate really accurately how electromagnetism behaves, we might be able to produce the same thing that we're able to see with our eyes, because our eyes can see electromagnetic radiation in the form of visible light. And if you can do that, you can create realistic pictures using just maths. This is a discipline called physically based computer graphics and is able to make incredibly photorealistic renderings by simulating electromagnetism. This, for example, isn't real. It's simulating electromagnetism through an approximation called Snell's law, which say how light is bent when moving through water or air or glass. The picture is made by running something called the rendering equation millions of times. This equation was developed by Jim Kaija at Microsoft, and it's an approximation of the Maxwell Heaviside equations for electromagnetism. In physically based rendering, there are layers and layers of approximation, but you can always trace them down to the foundation, which is the electromagnetic equations from Maxwell. But that's just one example of approximating a mathematical equation using a computer. Here's another very simple example of simulating gas molecules made at the University of Oslo. It's made by a Python script simulating the Leonard Jones potential, which gives us the force that is constantly pulling and pushing at atoms together. As you can see the chart, when they get too close, they are pushed apart, settling into this little throw here and falling into this when they're within range of the attraction. University of Oslo is actually very strong on computational physics and they're giving us tasks like this to play around with pretty early in the program. Simulations like this are done by creating a differential equation which splits the problem up into thousands of successive micro problems that we can use a computer to approximate. This is called numerical integration. And the smaller the step is, the more accurate the result is going to be. When we are approximating a mathematical equation, such as the Leonard Jones potential or the rendering equation of Kaija, we're kind of trying to get as close as possible to a theoretical analytical solution, which is the holy grail and correct answer. And computation is never able to get to this only approximate. And it's here, as I say, the real analytical solution that we can finally pinpoint a crucial difference between ordinary physics and digital physics. In digital physics, the analytical solution isn't the real deal. It's also just an approximation, or perhaps we should say idealization of the behavior of something deeper. What I'm trying to get at here is the question about whether something is fundamentally correct or just statistically correct. It's a tricky question because the distinction between a statistical relationship and a physical law is actually quite blurry. Take a pool table, for instance. If pool table balls behave like atoms, the game would be impossible to play. A ball could be randomly going sideways, even if you hit it straight on. In a cue ball, there are so many atoms on its surface that this randomness evens out and you have a predictable result it will go in exactly one direction. Notice what happened here. We got a new physical theory for larger objects off of the average behavior, behavior of atoms. The key point is this, the physical law that tells us how kinetic energy transfer is for bigger objects like balls and asteroids and planets is actually a statistical law of the aggregate behavior of millions of atoms that are actually doing the work. Whenever you have a really close fitting statistical law, it kind of becomes a law of physics. That's not a problem if you're just going to calculate answers and make predictions, but if you're wondering about the foundations of the universe, you want to know what is at the bottom. So we're dealing with two different possibilities. Either reality is governed by maths, and there is nothing deeper than that, but we can use computation to approximate that math. That's kind of the standard physics view. But it's not that physicists are certain that there's nothing deeper than maths. Scientists generally try to 
avoid asking questions they can't possibly answer. So they prefer to say something along the lines of, there might be uh, another level underneath our maths and current theories, but we can't prove it, we can't measure it, so there's no use of thinking about it. People who are into digital physics, like me, on the other hand, think there must be another level deeper than quantum mechanics, and that there are enough clues amassing to warrant a proper investigation. That means physical laws must be seen as statistical idealizations, equations that are capturing the typical idealized behavior of a complex statistical many-body problems. It's a compact way of describing an underlying, much more complex reality. Why can't electromagnetism be a simplification of something even deeper? If people who like digital physics are right in their suspicions, there must be something deeper than quantum mechanics. Clues tell us that it's related to the evolution of information. But what could possibly be deeper than quantum mechanics? That will be the subject of our next video titled, What the hell is cellular automata? Please subscribe to the channel and send me an email and I will send you an email back when I've got the next video ready for you. Thank you so much.